omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, I sins they are many. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Clovis Online. We are so grateful to have you here this morning, and we invite you, if you're here live with us, to go into the chat section, say good morning, say hi, we would love to hear from you. And if you're watching the service later in the week, we would still love to hear from you. Go into the comment section, uh, leave a comment, and we do check those comments, we will get back to you. Uh, we also want to remind you of some things going on during the week at First Baptist Church of Clovis. We're doing stuff uh, every week for children's ministry, for youth ministry, for young adults ministry. And if you'd like more information about any of those things, you can go to our website, www.fbclovis.com, to get more information. Good morning, church family. Nick here. I have a few quick announcements for you. 
First, our last gathering on campus outdoor uh, with a worship night and a quick message went over really well and the feedback was very positive that people would like to do it again. And so m this month, June 26th, Friday evening, we're going to be having another regathering. Uh, the exact time will be sent out to you via email uh, and Facebook. And so be looking for that time. We want to do it slightly later in the evening to get some of that shade since things are starting to warm up. Uh, but it's going to be very similar to the other uh, gathering that we had, plus hopefully uh, maybe a truck that has a dessert or yummy treat for everybody. Uh, the next thing that I have for you is that we are going to be resuming church services soon. Uh, we are shooting for at least penciled and beginning Sunday, July 5th, starting to regather. Now, as you know, we can't regather in the exact same ways that we were before. And so one of our ways to sort of uh, have a soft reopening is to do it outdoors. So we're going to have one service on July 5th and hopefully the Sundays afterwards where we'll be able to gather on the shady side of the worship center. Right now, we're shooting for early morning. We're looking at 9 a.m. Again, more details will come. You'll be able to either bring your own chair or a chair will be provided for you. Hopefully we'll have people, uh, ushers that are, would be willing to carry the chairs for you. We're going to have shady sections and pop-ups uh, for areas that don't have shade and areas for you to sit. We're going to have a worship experience. It's going to be outdoors, which greatly reduces the chance for the spread of anything that we don't want spreading. And so we invite you to come be a part of that. If you are someone that is in an at-risk category, we do invite you to stay home, be safe, and do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Uh, this There is no judgment for not coming to church. In fact, if you're at an at-risk category, I would prefer you stay home until we have a better grasp on everything going on. But for those that are not at risk, uh, we will be able to gather. Uh, I'd like to give it a shot for at least the four weeks in July and see what that looks like. Uh, if we need to move a little bit earlier in the morning, we will. If we need to change things up, we will. We're just running forward with the plan to gather beginning July 5th. Uh, we're also going to be having stickers and buttons for people uh, that say, you know, hugger, fist bumper, and waver. And that sort of lets you know where people's comfort levels are. And there's no judgment for wearing any one of those, keeping a great distance or being a hugger. We just ask that everyone respect other people's boundaries. If you are part of a small group, many of them are starting to meet to actually watch the church services on Sunday mornings in each other's homes and share a meal together. Small gatherings like this are encouraged. Uh, they are a lot safer than meeting indoor uh, with a large number of people. So if you have a small group uh, that you'd like to meet with, you know, let them know that you'd like to meet. Uh, not everyone's in the same place, but go ahead and explore that topic. If you're looking for a small group to gather with on a Sunday morning, uh, uh, not at the church, then let us know and hopefully we can plug you in with somebody. If you haven't seen some of our VBS content this year, we of course had to move online, but we've tried to produce good content for parents to be able to run uh, a VBS at home with their kids. Some goofy videos where we have some fun science-y sermon illustrations for people to laugh at and watch. Uh, we have a Jesus talk where we uh, encourage kids to accept Christ, and we equip parents to have fun activities that point them towards Jesus. Uh, they are, uh, while they're geared for people in the elementary school age, I think anyone of any age could watch them and at least get a chuckle out of it. Maybe even learn a good sermon illustration for yourself. And lastly, I want to address everything that is going on in our world. As I've said before, it feels like every few hours, everything changes. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the incredible heartache and, and racial tension that is occurring uh, in our nation now. And, uh, you know, some people have asked me to say some things and it's honestly, it's, it's difficult for me because I have so many thoughts on so many different topics. Um, I love everybody and I support everybody uh, to have a chance to know Jesus. And so I'll just sum it up with this right now. And if you'd like to have a more in-depth conversation with me, please reach out and let me know. I've been having many with uh, friends that are people of color on the East Coast and here and uh, with police officer friends of mine and just sort of making sure I'm, I'm not just ignoring these important topics and being tone deaf, but really jumping into them. Uh, and I guess the way I'd like to encourage you most is that what I'm finding is that people who have Christ 
at their center that they are truly trying to run these issues through the gospel, the truth of Jesus, even when they disagree on certain topics, it's fascinating that there's still love, there's still genuine tolerance to say, man, I, I don't think we're seeing things eye to eye, but at the end of the day, I do love you and respect where you're at and that you're trying. And so I just invite anyone that calls himself a follower of Christ to continue to use uh, Jesus, lean on Jesus as the source for how you think about anything. Don't rely on what's comfortable. Don't rely on what you've known to work in the past, but rely on Jesus to give you the fruit of the Spirit so that you can engage in healthy conversation uh, so that we can have solutions that glorify Christ, not glorify a nation or glorify a people, uh, but to glorify Christ. I know it sounds cheesy, but Jesus really is the answer to the world's problems. When we love like Jesus and we are the hands and feet of Jesus, it's very difficult to argue uh, and, and to uh, be at war with each other. So I just encourage you to draw closer to Christ and let him speak to you on how to speak to this world. Thank you. And if you want to talk more, please absolutely feel free to reach out. I love you and I'm praying for all of you.
worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
and the guilt and the shame. Jesus bore my suffering to the grave to make me free. Oh, the blood that was shed, it now flows to cover sin. It washes clean, purifies, and it's healing crimson tide. Jesus, he took my place in divine exchange. Hallelujah, grace is mine. Now I will live by faith for the one who saves. He gave all to give me life. The Spirit is my present help. I'd be lost all by myself. He resurrected. He takes his power and makes it mine. Jesus, he took my place in divine exchange. Hallelujah, grace is mine. Now I will live by faith for the one who says he gave all to give me life. of things or great again he is alive inside of me I lay down all lesser things for great again he is alive inside of me I lay down all lesser things for great again alive inside of me. I lay down all lesser things for greater gain. He is alive. Oh, Jesus, he took my place. excited to be here with you this morning as we continue our series on suffering well. Over the last few weeks, we've taken a look at famous biblical figures like Stephen and the Jews as they went into exile. We've looked at Esther and Daniel, and we've taken a look at these stories and these people, these real live people in biblical history, and asked, how did they or didn't they suffer well? My hope is that, one, as we go through and we look at some of these do's and don'ts on suffering well, we, we first, I guess the thing that I hope that we get out of it most is we just love reading our Bibles, that we love digging into Scripture and looking uh, what is descriptive and what is prescriptive in Scripture and just fall in love curling up with our Bible and reading what God's Word has for us, the story of God's people under God's rule. 
And two, I hope that we can explore this topic and ponder whether or not that we suffer well. Uh, so I guess you could say for the most part, people that will be watching this will be, um, you know, Western uh, Christians here in America. And do we suffer well? And in the last few weeks, we, we kind of took an honest look and said, you know, in some ways we do, but in a lot of ways we don't. And if we're not good sufferers, it means that we'll fall into things like complaining or being easily angered, or we resort to revenge, whether that's verbal or physical revenge. We have a hard time forgiving others. We take it out online. Uh, we find joy when enemies suffer and sometimes even pray for their downfall. And then it's an indicator I believe it's an indicator on whether or not we're following in the footsteps of Jesus when he says to pick up your cross and follow me, to suffer, and not only to suffer, but to suffer well. It's when we do that well that the world turns and looks, us, looks at us and goes, how are you doing that? You're not winning the game. You're not having success. And we can just proudly say, yes, we are. We're, we're being obedient to our Lord. And that's all we care to do. He loves us and we love him. Now, as we go through this, you know, sometimes in series like this, there might be a challenge that makes people feel judged or like we're picking on you or something. And that's not the heart. The heart is not for condemnation. It's for transformation. As Romans 12, 2 tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So let's jump in today and meet who we'll be discussing. His name is Elijah. And I love this story for so many reasons. And some of you have likely even heard me tell parts of his story and in different ways. And I apologize if you've heard it before, but like a good meal, sometimes it's worth going back for seconds. And so we're going to take a look at this historical figure and biblical figure uh, that the Jewish community and Christian community knows quite a lot about. But just in case you don't, uh, a quick sort of recap of who Elijah is, because you've probably heard of him in Scripture. Uh, at the end of his life, by the way, he's one of, uh, I think, only two biblical people that we know of that didn't die. Like, they, their life ended, but not in a death sense. He was carried up in a whirlwind, like a, a tornado, up into the air for his disciple, Elisha, to see. Uh, his story, his time, takes place about 900 years before Jesus. He's so famous in the Jewish community that many, even to this day, in Jewish culture, when they have certain feasts and festivals uh, where people are sitting at a table, they will leave one chair empty and call that the seat of Elijah, you know, just in case he comes back. Uh, Elijah pops up numerous times, uh, even in, or at least a couple times in the New Testament, at the Transfiguration, uh, when Jesus and James, John, and Peter go up on top of a mountain, and it says that Jesus began to glow, and that Moses and Elijah appeared alongside of him. And Peter and the guys were like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Let's stay here. Elijah's a big deal. And in his time, the 900 years before Christ, 900 BC, he lived in Israel in a time where out of the 20 kings that Israel had, the Bible says that zero were good. Zero followed the Lord. And they just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. And then we get to a king named Ahab. And the Bible, when it like condemns you or when it calls you beautiful, like that's a big deal. You have scripture singing your praises or condemning you. But the Bible says that King Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any king before him, that he was despicable, that, that even as a Jewish person, he set up, uh, you know, poles and temples for false gods, the Asherah poles, uh, the temples for Baal, and it disgusted the Lord. And so we're going to take a look at how Elijah, a prophet, someone who's supposed to safeguard the word of God and tell the people and its, the, its kings, hey, listen, this is what the Lord says to do. And this is what the Lord says not to do. And poor Elijah is living in a time where almost nobody is listening to God. Now, I love 
origin stories. I love, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for, you know, say like the Star Wars movies and, and when the prequels came out, whether you liked them or not, I loved hearing the backstory. Uh, now we have even Marvel movies where you have, you know, Black Widow and, uh, you know, Terminator prequels. I mean, like everything, everyone just digs prequel stories. And so to set up a bit of that for you, I want to take a look at Elijah towards the end of his ministry, or at least after a lot had happened. In 1 Kings 19, 3, I want to ask, how did Elijah go from this to something else? And I'll start with this. 1 Kings 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. He came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So that's where he's at. He's in despair. He wants to die. He's literally just praying, Lord, just kill me. I, I can't even go on. He's, he's sleeping. He's tired. He's exhausted. And so I ask, how does he go from this in 1 Kings 19 to fast forwarding a little bit to 2 Kings chapter 1? The king said that was Elijah the Tishbite. Then he sent to Elijah a captain with his company of 50 men. And the captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from the heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Wow. Okay, so just so you know, a little backstory. I wanted to, you know, condense it a little bit. This was the this was one of three times that these men came for Elijah. We go from Elijah being scared and just wanting to die and running for his life to all of a sudden he's like on a recliner on a rock, just kind of sitting there, and a group of 50 men come up to him and say, "Get down here, the king commands." And he goes, "Okay, well, uh, if you say I'm a man of God, then may fire come on down and boom, blows him up." Then a second company of 50 men come and say basically the same thing with slightly softer language. Would you please come on down? And he goes, well, if you say I'm a man of God, then may fire come down and consume you. And boom, happens again. And it wasn't until the third time that this group came and the captain of these men like, was begging. He's like, look, man, just please, will you come? My king's sending me. I don't want to die. My wife's got, you know, food in the kitchen. Just don't kill us. We're only listening to our king. And he says, will you please come down? And the Lord spoke to Elijah and said, yeah, you, you can go on down. And so then Elijah does. So how do we get from cowering Elijah to like fireball throwing, I'm super confident, Elijah? I mean, it could have been the fact that in this time period, there was a drought. In fact, Elijah prayed for a drought just to show the people to have them suffering and just beg for God's forgiveness. But it only made people even more mad. Uh, eventually, Elijah would see a miracle and the drought end. I mean, that could have been what ended it. But maybe it was the fact that Elijah, when he was running, he ran and he was tended to, like he went and he drank from a brook and God said, go down there and I will send food for you. And so while he was drinking from this brook, it says that ravens delivered him bread and meat. That's a tri-tip sandwich. Like I could be anywhere and I would, if it happened one time and like a, a doghouse grill tri-tip sandwich plopped out of the sky into my hand, even just once, I would never forget that. And I would tell the story like every day and at every party and be the cool kid in the room. This happened for an extended period of time. Wake up in the morning, I oh, wonder what's for breakfast. And a raven would drop bread and meat in his hand. God proving that, hey, Elijah, don't despair I am tending to your needs. Was that it? No, nope, that wasn't it. A little bit after that, Elijah's told to go down to this town where he'd find a widow and to connect with her and ask her for food. So Elijah goes down and he asks her for food. And, and she says, as Lord is my witness, I have no food. And she says she has, she's literally getting ready to go back home to her son where they're going to cook the last little bit of flour and last little bit of oil, make a tiny little cake for the two of them, and then they're going to die. She literally says that. I'm getting ready to go eat my last meal, and then me and my son are going to die. That's how bad it is. I don't have tri-tip sandwiches for you, buddy. Sorry. But Elijah says, listen, go and uh, go ahead and make yourself 
a little you know, flour and oil cake, but give me the first one and see what happens. And it said for an ex- like a huge extended period of time, the day after day, meal after meal, that flour and that oil never gave out. I mean, if that happened to me, like the never ending cereal bowl, like it just keeps going, that would be enough for me to be like, no, I've seen miracles, I will follow God. And I've got stories for days. But that wasn't it. We also know that this widow and her son, the son gets sick, and he actually, it says, one day just died. He got sicker and sicker every day and died. And the widow's like, please do something. So Elijah says that he he lays his body over the top of the boy, and he just commands that he comes back to life, and he prays, and then boom, the boy comes back to life. This wasn't like a medical procedure. They didn't do CPR back then. He didn't have like shock paddles, you know, static electricity. This kid died and Elijah called out to God to save him and the boy came back to life. That's huge. I I don't know many people who have a story like that outside of like medical stories. Any one of these things would have done it, I believe, potentially for you or I to be like, God is good and I will follow him even if times get tough. So do you think any of these were the reason right before Elijah gets bold and and calls down fire from heaven? Nope, that's not what happened. But there's one more story, at least, that takes place that makes you think, okay, maybe that was the turning point. Maybe this was the thing that got Elijah super bold. And it picks up in 1 Kings chapter 18. And the king's wife named Jezebel, it's important to know that she has gone around and she's a pagan follower and worships the Baals and all this stuff. She's been killing true prophets and followers of God. She's been systematically killing them. And then there's this one servant of the king who's secretly hiding these prophets. His name is Obadiah. And he's super worried because he's got like a hundred of these prophets hiding out in various caves. And then Elijah comes up to him and he's like, hey, Obadiah, go tell your king I'm ready to meet with him. And Obadiah is like super freaked out. He's like, "Ah, why would I do that? He hates you so much. I know you're just going to go run. I'm going to go tell him that I saw you. The king Ahab's going to come here. You won't be here and he's going to kill me. That's how much he hates you, Elijah. And Elijah's like, no, I'm taking a stand. Here I am, tell him to come here. We're going to have a royal rumble. And so we pick up in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. 850 false prophets. You go ahead and bring them. We're going to have a throwdown. It'll be one versus 850 and we're going to see what happens. Something has Elijah all pumped up, and he has this plan. And, and in his mind, God is going to do something in front of everybody that nobody could deny that God is in charge. God is doing something amazing here. And Elijah's like, let's see how this goes down. They will surely follow the Lord after this. We pick up in verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. I just want to pause there for a second. This verse always stands out to me because it's incredibly logical and it's incredibly fair. It's not even like judgmental against those that don't follow the Lord. I have friends and neighbors and people that I I dearly love, but they say things like, oh yeah, I, I love God. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah. And it's like, yeah, but... I don't want to be judgy, but you don't. You're not devoted to his teaching. You're not devoted to his people. You're not devoted to doing good for others. I mostly hear hear you argue about politics, and I hear you condemn others, and you're mostly really angry all the time. You don't seem to have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good. We studied that. I'm not seeing that. And so Elijah breaks it down real simple. If the Lord is God, follow him. Don't just wear the jersey and take it off when the game gets tough. 
that the Lord is God. Pick up your cross, follow him, suffer well, do what he asks you to do and do it with joy. But if Baal is God, follow him. If something in this world seems to uh, meet your need, that hole in everyone's heart, that God-shaped hole in everyone's heart, but something fills it, go ahead and follow it. If, you know, chasing after women or boys, you know, that that is really fulfilling you, do it. If it's money, do it. If it's fame, do it. If it's Super Bowls, do it. But even quoting Tom Brady, he's been quoted after winning three or four, four Super Bowls as, is this it? I guess I thought it would feel different. I just want to throw out there that there is nothing that will fill that God-shaped hole except for God, Jesus. And Elijah's getting ready to say to all the people, listen, if God's real, don't just stand there and say he's real and then ignore him. Say he's real and then follow him. And if something else in this world seems to prove itself more, go ahead and follow it, follow it. But good luck with that because there's nothing that stands up anywhere near as good as God. But the people said nothing. Verse 22, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Now I'll prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. By the way, I love this. I mean, we are really just a mob of people. In one sense, he, he goes after their logic. All right, what do you think about this? If God is real, follow him. If he's not, then follow Baal. And the people said nothing. Then he brings in fireworks. All right, we'll set up two sacrifices. We'll ask for fire to fall down and consume it, and whichever one makes the most sparks and fireworks, you follow that God. Fire, yes, what you say is good. And so Elijah, verse 25, said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. That's at least, you know, three plus hours. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But unshockingly, there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. These taunts are funny, and especially to the Jewish reader, would make them chuckle. Because he's basically saying, listen, what kind of God is too busy? I mean, if he made everything, how could it be too busy for you? Maybe he's deep in thought or busy. This word busy is a euphemism for using the restroom. Maybe he's indisposed or, you know, he ran out of toilet paper or something. And this would have just made them even matter. Or maybe he's traveling, which would suggest that, well, if he's on the other side of the planet, you know, his bat phone doesn't reach as far. And he's taunting how small their God just might be. In verse 28, you see them getting riled up. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. And this is where over the last you know, decade plus that I've been sharing this story, I get a little weirded out because slashing yourself, cutting until you can see blood has been a custom all the way back to pagan days. And it's not a surprise to many of you that many of our youth uh, in society generally that struggle with depression and anger and issues will resort to cutting just to feel something. And it's, it's deeply troubling, and, it, and, and there's usually a disorder to go along with it, but I also can't help but feel like there's also a spiritual issue going on. You know, I don't want to get into whether it's possession or whatever, but at very least, temptation. And we're talking about the side of Satan that enjoys to see something made in the image of God harm itself. And we see it all the way back in 900 BC for people who are following something other than God. Verse 29, we pick up, midday passed, 
And they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. So morning, noon, evening. That is a long time to be dancing and chanting. I mean, you got to be exhausted at this point. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. I mean, could you imagine like chanting so long? You're just like, oh, and then at the end, your hands are on your knees like, oh, hold on. I, I just I just need a minute. My I'm probably it's it's me. It's me. Uh, my God probably doesn't hear me because I'm not yelling loud enough or something. I mean, this would be hugely embarrassing. There's 850 of them. Maybe they took shifts, so there was always someone chanting, but it doesn't work. So there's a silence in the crowd, and it's Elijah's turn. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, "Come here to me." And he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. These jars would be, would be huge, like think 50-gallon drum kind of things. And he wants it poured on the wood. Have you ever tried starting a fire with wet wood? It's not easy. So they pour it on the wood and on the offering. Verse 34, do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it the third time. And the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. It is soaking, sopping wet. Uh, if you poured gasoline on it at this point and tried to light it, it likely wouldn't catch well at all. Verse 36, at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. He doesn't start with a wish. He starts with an acknowledgement before he does anything, asks anything, seeks anything. He just stops and says, you are God. You are good. You are who you say you are. And before we ask anything, you are already good enough. And I take delight in doing what you command. And so this is huge for us because instead of saying, God, I need you to do this for me, I think it's important for us. And I, in the last few years, I've tried at least when I pray to, to sort of start my prayers with, Lord, before we come and ask anything of you, we stop and acknowledge who you are and what you've already done for us before we ask anything. Thankfully, though, he says we can come to him with prayer and petition and ask, but it's important for us to remember to first acknowledge before we ask anything of our creator. And so he does this. Verse 37, now he says, answer me, O Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's hot fires in the world, okay, but they generally don't fall from the sky, and they generally don't get hot enough to where they burn up you know, the sacrifice, the altar, the wood, the stone, burn the dirt. I can understand the water boiling off, but like, I didn't know you could burn dirt. That's incredible. So God, again, stacks the deck against himself just to say, look, man, this thing is soaking wet. There's no tricks. There's no gimmicks. It's 850 to one. The one that's going to win isn't in power. To, as if to sort of say, listen, you are done with excuses. Look who the real God is. And that's what happens. They stop and they say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And immediately afterwards, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, they were defeated. They were killed and, and ran out. Now, that's, this again is Old Testament. We're not called to go kill our enemies. Uh, but for such a time as this, this was commanded. Um, and then immediately following this, uh, that drought that Elijah had prayed for, it ended on command. Ahab, King Ahab, he tucks tail and he runs home to his wife Jezebel. Uh, and then it ends, this chapter ends with an amazing verse. 
1 Kings 18.46, the power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So now he's filled with the power of the Lord. He can call down these fireballs. So like this had to be the event. This had to be the thing that kept him or took him from, you know, crying, let me die, Lord, to being able to chill and not care about a company of 50 guys coming to arrest him, right? Everyone just needs one big miracle and then everything changes, right? Wrong. What happened immediately is that he ran. But what could make him run? He just defeated 850 false prophets. And all the people saw how awesome God is and what Elijah was able to do with God on his side. What could make him run? Well, we see in the very next chapter, 1 Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Doesn't he sound kind of whiny? King Ahab then goes and tells his wife, he killed all my prophets and he made me look dumb. And he goes and he tells her, but it's not Ahab, King Ahab, that Elijah is afraid of. It's his wife, Jezebel. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, one of the dead prophets. And so at this, from the threat of a queen, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Again, I like to think any one of those miracles that I mentioned before, you know, the ravens, they're bringing the boy back to life, even especially this one with where he beats 850 false prophets, any one of them would have worked for me and I'd be telling the story forever. And I like to entertain the thought that my faith would never be shaken, but then it hit me, yeah, it probably would. I mean, you're talking about Elijah. There was a reason that he was handpicked for this assignment. He had to have been incredibly faithful, especially in a time like this. And if he was able to turn and be scared and, and beg to die, then there's a really good shot that I would too. But I still think there's something to be learned from him and that can apply to us. Now, let's be clear. We don't know if Elijah suffered perfectly well or not. But let's explore it a little bit. The reason we don't know exactly for sure, because the Bible doesn't tell us that he didn't suffer well or that this was sin or that was sin. It was understandable that he would be suffering and that it would be hard and that he might say something like, I just wish I were dead. His God was being defamed. There was nothing he could do about it. His peers, his fellow prophets and followers of God were being systematically killed. The country was being ran by evil, murderous pagans that had it out for him. And he's saying, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. And so the good things that we can learn for, from Elijah is that he went to God with his cries. He went to God with any complaints or issues that he had. He didn't complain to others. He didn't curse God to others. He didn't question God's sovereignty. What are you doing in all of this, God? But even then, if you have an issue with what's going on in the world or your life, it's okay to go to God with it. And even, I dare say, complain to him. He's a big loving father and he can take you pounding on his chest. But go to him, not to the world, because the world won't have answers like God does. It's him that's in control. God is a good, loving father that you can go to and say, I don't like it and I don't get it, but I love and trust you. And I pray that you give me your eyes so that I can see what you're doing. And Elijah seemed to do that. So let's take a quick look at arguably what Elijah might not have done so well. We'll call it the bad. Well, we know that he was afraid and he ran. I mean, he ran because he was afraid. And we know in Scripture that we're commanded not to be afraid. Do not fear. I mean, the Bible literally says it in the Old and New Testament dozens and dozens of times not to fear the world, but fear the Lord instead, especially after he knew really well that God was with him and doing something in him. I mean, he ran after he was filled with God's power. 
He was arguably focused on the results of God being with him. Not God just being with him, but the results of it. Politics, conversions, winning the battle. Not whether or not he was obedient. You see, I think it's important for us to remember that peace that surpasses understanding often comes when a person focuses only on whether or not they followed God. This happens when we desire the miracles and not the miracle maker, or when we love creation more than the creator. We're focused outward instead of focused upward, and that's huge. Remember, the power of the Lord came on Elijah, he, and, he, and Elijah felt God's power, but he didn't necessarily feel God's presence, or at least missed it. So, what finally turned Elijah from a scaredy cat in a cave into a fireball-tossing, bold leader? Well, we see it in 1 Kings 19. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. Not the power of the Lord, not the miracles of the Lord, but in the presence of the Lord Himself. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. This is incredible. Like, just imagine... Elijah he comes out of the cave, he's defeated, he's sad, the Lord was kind enough, he like woke up with a little meal next to him, it's there in scripture, and he's fed, and the Lord tells him, go stand out there, go be in the presence of the Lord, and there's, you know, this great wind strong enough to crack rocks, and Elijah's looking around, and he's like, hmm, the Lord's not in the wind, and then there's this earthquake, and the mountains are shaking, I wonder where the Lord is. Then there's like this fire tornado like all around him. Man, where is God? I mean, you just have this chaotic scene, this picture of massive power. Uh, unlike anything that someone back then would be able to see. Heck, if it happened today, we'd be like, oh my gosh, what's happening? This is life altering uh, what I'm witnessing right here. I mean, if that happened, you'd be like, it was incredible. It had to be God. And God almost does these massive things in front of Elijah to say, listen, as big as these things are, the, compared to me, they're parlor tricks. They're nothing. They're just what I can do with creation. And then we see the thing that changes Elijah. It wasn't the wind. It wasn't the earthquake. It wasn't the fire. And after the fire came, a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. It wasn't those things. It was a whisper. Like one of the questions I want to ask Elijah, what did he say? This is like, boo. Or did he say, go? Or did he say, I'm here? I mean, he wouldn't really need to say anything. He could just say, mm-hmm. But he heard a whisper. It wasn't the miracles. It was the miracle maker. That is what filled Elijah up. That is what made him throw on his hoodie and say, that's it. I'm going to go tackle the world for the Lord. I will no longer live in fear. I can't help but wonder what Elijah might have thought if he could somehow teleport to where we are today, like time jump, but didn't know all of God's story, you know, Jesus coming and everything. And if we could talk to him right after we met with Jesus, or even like now today, and we would tell him stories about God being in the flesh with us and be like, wait, what? All I got was a whisper and you got to like walk with him? Like he spoke to you? I mean, what else happened? I mean, did you guys like tell Joe? Did you laugh? He cried. He wept for you. I mean, did he talk a lot? I mean, all I got was a whisper. I mean, he, he was probably only here for like how three years. Did he say a lot? And we're like, yeah, we got a whole New Testament, you know, or gospel, four gospels filled with what he said. And his mind would have to be blown. And he would likely be like, what? He, he washed your feet? Whoa, the God that made the earthquake, the wind, the fire, washed your feet. He'd be like, yeah. And he'd be like, what'd you do with them? Did you make him king, president? You know, did you follow him? Uh, what happened after the three years? You did what? And we would have to tell him that humankind killed Jesus. And 
it would just blow his mind the squashed opportunity that we had. It's a crazy, awesome thought that while Elijah had the power of God and his kind lived with the miracles of God, he would be like, we don't want the miracles of God. We want the presence of God. And you guys have that. And he'd be looking at us and he'd be like, you have the Holy Spirit in you at all times, in every situation, not just certain times. We don't just have his power, we have his presence. And when our focus is on the truth that God is with us and not on what God will do for us, everything changes. Sometimes we win in the eyes of the world and sometimes we lose. But in the eyes of God and eternity, the battle belongs to the Lord and he has already won. He has conquered the grave and we're already won with him. We're not residents of this world. We are citizens of heaven. And so the question for all of us, are we seeking God or are we seeking what God has made? Are we seeking God or are we just seeking the cool stuff that he can give us? A happy life, a good job, good friends, uh, more money, good status, more comfort, more laws we like, more candidates that we want. Is he, a, is he a means to an end or is he the end itself? It's okay to desire these things. He loves that we love his creation. It's okay to even pray for these things, but not at the expense of drawing near to God first. The truth is, the closer and more in tune we are with God, the less many of these other things really even matter. So, are you seeking creations or the Creator? Miracles or the miracle maker? The shift might just change your life. But more importantly, it'll draw you near to the one who made you, who loves you, and died for you. May each of us rest in the presence of of our Lord daily as we suffer well for his glory and hopes to return his people to him. So I challenge everyone to ask two questions this week, either right after this sermon or just write it down somewhere and reflect during the week. Ask someone else, ask yourself, whatever works for you. But the two questions I have for all of us are, in what ways are you seeking creations or miracles? And the second question how might you seek the Creator more? If you need help with either of these things, want to talk about it, have a Breezeway conversation. I love that many of you have reached out and said, I want to meet in the Breezeway and chat about some stuff. Sometimes it's just sports and weather. Sometimes it's about spiritual issues. I would love to do that. So let us know how we can support you, how we can pray for you, and resource you, and commune with you. Please allow me to pray, and we'll conclude this time. Father God, thank you. Before we ask anything of you, we stop and acknowledge who you are. You are sovereign. You are good. You are amazing. Lord, you are the creator of everything. You are almighty, king of kings, lord of lords. And we ask nothing of you in this moment. We just stand in awe of you. That you would even hear this prayer is beyond our understanding. And the fact that you then say we can come to you with prayers and petition is astonishing. And so, Lord, we do ask of you. We ask that you help us stay focused on you, to strive for obedience in loving you, to give us the strength to love you and to love others well. We pray for our world that desperately needs to see you more. It sounds cheesy, Lord, to us, but we know that Jesus is the answer. And so I pray that we help not be a stumbling block to people knowing Jesus. And we pray that you continue to heal our world physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, in all ways. Redeem your people to you. Let us continue to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, Lord, because we want people to see you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can study it. Uh, and thank you for the examples, both good and bad, that we can find in it. It is true and it can affect our lives, and we're grateful for it. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us always and in all things. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus 
house is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. We just want to say thank you for watching, and we hope you are really blessed by today's message and today's worship. If you have any questions, please head over to fbclovis.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Have a great one. Bye.
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. try. 